very much to conversation. It's a great, distinct pleasure to welcome to the program a real intellectual of uh, a high order, having just read a good deal of his book uh, and also some of his background. And that's uh, Jacques, and pronounce it, it uh, Powell's. Uh, Powell's are like yes, Powell's, Powell's. Like, uh, like Powell's. It's a good Flemish uh, name. Yeah, good. It's a Flemish name. That's right. And he's got a book. I'll bring it out to look at it. We got it in the background, but this is the way it could look. Uh, 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 the Myth of the Good war, war, um, America in the Second World War, and it's a wonderful cover and so forth, and it's such a well-written book. I really Thank congratulate you. you. I'm so pleased to have you on the Thank set you. to talk about it and yourself, sir. Okay. Pleasure being here. Okay. You're, Brit you're, you're Belgian from the background, but could you share your own background, please? Yes. You know, born and raised, that sort of thing. Right. I was uh, born and raised in, in Belgium, in the Flemish part of Belgium, uh -huh. not in the French-speaking part. But Makes a distinction, right? Oh, big difference. There's a linguistic Germanic? border. Is there a Germanic? There's a, yeah, so there's a linguistic border running yeah. east-west to Belgium. Right. The northern part speaks uh, is Germanic. Uh -huh. It speaks uh, the, what we call Flemish. Yeah. But it's really the Dutch language. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. It's the same grammar, the same literature as the Dutch language, but it's it sounds different. It's is like Canadian versus Australian uh, or British uh, English. I see. Is there a cultural difference much uh, between the Netherlands and Belgium, or how do they? Is there? Mm. There's a there's a friendly rivalry, or what's the reality? Yes, it's there? A, there's a very good relationship. In fact, mm. uh, yeah. for a long time the history was joined. It's uh -huh. a bit. Yeah. Like other countries that yeah. you know were together and moved apart, yeah. um, there's a lot of similarities between Belgium and the Netherlands, and yeah. there's some differences as well. You know, yeah, no yeah. doubt, no doubt about it. Yeah. The, ma the major difference would be that Belgium is a bilingual culture, a bilingual oh, country, oh, right. yeah. and Belgium overwhelmingly, whether even when you're Flemish, it yeah. faces France. France yeah. is the big neighbor. Yeah. So right. historically, mm -hmm. we've been part of France, mm -hmm. and the French influence is very, very big. Yeah. And uh, it's a bit like Canada and the United States. You I know? see. You're right. And right. many, many people that don't know better think. Of certain Belgians that they are that they are, that they are French, like Jacques Brel, for yeah, example. Yeah, right, when I right, was right, in New York right. at one point, Jacques Brel is alive yeah. and well and living in Paris was yeah. a, a big hit here on Broadway. Right, indeed. Well, Jacques Brel didn't really live in Paris; he lived <laughs> in Belgium, you know. And Tintin, the, yeah. and yeah. Hercule yeah. Poirot, you oh, know. Oh, people think Agatha these are Christie, French yeah. people, but of course yeah. they're, they're 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 Belgian. Yeah, right. So Belgium, the French fact, yeah. uh -huh. the French cultural linguistic mm -hmm. fact, is mm -hmm. very big, and mm -hmm. it's not in the Netherlands. Yeah. In the Netherlands, on the other hand, they uh, have a big neighbor called Germany, yeah. and they're much more oriented to Germany. Uh -huh. But Belgium and Holland are also very much oriented to each other. You and know, what, so did, what do we, I'm, I'm Anglo-Saxon, my yes. name is Harold. Right, Harold. 1066 Yes, yes and of all course, that. yeah, William, <laughs> William soccer to you, right? <laughs> yeah, and there was a lot of, so. There was a lot of Flemish in the army but of William. I like to draw the example of the movie Robin Hood. Have you yes. ever seen yes. the Robin Hood with Errol Nobody Quinn? Nobody the story. Robin no, no. <laughs> you know the, you have another film? No, everybody's seen that film was Errol Flynn being the great hero yes. who was sa standing up for the poor people of the area against the yeah. bad guys. He was the good guy, so I like to associate with. But uh, yeah. Anglo-Saxon uh, and England had a great deal to do with Germanic background, yes, I well think, and the English language, at I think, don't you? Yeah, so does that put it up toward the Netherlands right. and so forth? At though? the end of the, uh, the Roman Empire, the, yeah. when the barbarian invasions came, yeah. the yeah. Germanic tribes moved in, and the Saxons yeah. were a tribe that actually came in, and they moved, some of them moved to the, uh, to the British Isles, yeah. the Saxons of Harold, yeah. and some of them moved to, to what in Roman text was called the, Sa the Litu Saxonicum, the uh -huh. Saxon coast, uh -huh. and that's the coast of Holland and Belgium. I'll be there. Okay, so there yeah, was on okay. both sides, actually, Saxons living there on both sides. So there's camaraderie And that's there. Germanic. Uh -huh. However, Mm. The Franks were yeah. another Germanic tribe that also yeah. moved in, and that were actually the dominant element in the Low Countries. So yeah. the Dutch and Flemish of today owes more to the Frankish German uh -huh. of old than to the Saxon one. Yeah. But along the coast, certainly there was a Saxon influence. Yeah. And for example, in parts of Belgium, yeah. the, the language in, is near the coast is very similar to English in many ways. I'll be down. Okay. Well, yeah. it's interesting. So that's where you're born and raised. And family was yes. uh, what was the family setting? And you did well, some education. Well, there actually, I was born in the city of Ghent, which uh -huh, uh, of yeah. course is famous in of, American yeah. and Canadian history for the mm. Treaty of Ghent yeah. of 1814, which mm. in Ghent nobody ever heard of mm. because it didn't affect them really. You know, <laughs> yeah. there was just a, a bunch of foreign diplomats getting together and deciding on a war which was fought on the other side of the Atlantic, yes, while in Europe they were fo focused on the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, sure. So nobody yeah. gave a darn really what happened on the right, other side. Right, and right. That's a non-event as far mm. as Ghent was concerned. Yes, uh -huh. Ghent has a turbulent history mm. with lots of uh, interesting events and tragic events and bloody affairs and so yeah, on. Yeah. So that, that was a, a non-event, you know, non so to speak. Kay. But yeah, my family, though, I was born in Ghent, but we lived in a small village between Ghent and Bruges. Yeah. So in the flat country Bruges, near the coast. Yeah. Lace. 
and, Place, and, 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 and a great uh, cathedral. A great, a great cathedral, a great belfry. Yeah. With, without right. bats, you yeah. know, you know the expression the bats in yeah, your belfry. Right, right, yeah. The belfry is actually was a symbol of the power of the cities in the Middle Ages. Oh, I see, yeah. So the bigger the city, the more powerful, the wealthier, the bigger your belfry. It was a bit of a phallic symbol. He says something interesting to me. It has a lot of history. Yep. Now, we all have the same amount of history, really. Yes. But that is that there's a lot of interesting things that there went is. on in that history. I guess well, that's what we mean when we say there's a lot of history. Right? Well, because we all have the same amount of history, all human beings. That, that's right? true. We do. Yeah. We do. Yeah. We do. There's no lack of, sh of history. <laughs> yeah, you know. Right. And some the question some sometimes stories is are better than others. Or exactly. Yeah, the, right. Sometimes the question is, is the yeah. kind of history you wanted. Yeah. Or you would right. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 Some of the history that I already, as a uh, child, you yeah. know, picked up. Yeah. When I was, I arranged to be born after the Second World War. Oh, I told yeah. my parents to hold off. And I was born in '46. But in my Family, there was a lot of talk about the First World War and the Second World War. Yeah, sure. Oh, because God, the First World War was yeah. such a horror. And yeah. the Second. And, yeah. and traditionally, Belgium was, the, there was the, the small part of Europe where everybody else came to fight their wars. Yes, yeah, right. I understand. The British used to call the cockpit of Europe. And that's where the Ardennes is. Yes, the Ardennes. The Battle exactly. of the Bulge yeah, yeah. fought in Belgium, yeah. right? But let me tell you about the cockpit of, of Europe. And uh, I learned uh, this expression when I first started to read English books about the history of, of Europe. And it said the cockpit of Belgium after the cockpit in an airplane. Yeah. Why, why would that term come from? Mm -hmm. Until I understood, of course, it was a, a cockpit where the cocks, the roosters <laughs> fight. You know, oh. that's, it, that's, oh. where, that's where it happened. Oh, yeah, it meant, it right. meant Belgium was a little place uh. where the, the big boys is that what they meant put by their that roosters too. to fight. And that's you what know. they meant. And that's what they meant. Yeah. Yeah. So there's nothing to do with the cockpit of uh, Belgium. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> you can get things confused. Yeah. 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 And there had been no cock fighting, no rooster fighting in Belgium for many, many years. Yeah, so right, to right. me, it meant nothing at first. Yeah. You know, it, it finally, the, you know, it dawned How was the family setting? Was it intellectually oriented? Was it warm, well, friendly? Yes, was we it were a very conservative, you know. Conservative. Well, well conservative family, yes, ah. indeed. Because Flanders, until yeah. recently, was very conservative, very Catholic, okay. extremely Catholic, and, and uniquely so. Like in my village, there was one church, no. uh -huh. and there was nobody that was not Catholic. Who needs but one? And huh? everybody would go to the Catholic school yeah, at my right. age, and everybody would go to communion, and everybody would, do, would marry in the church, and everybody would be buried in the church, and everybody, like the idea that there was actually people who believed something else, you know, that they were actually out there Protestants, well, we knew they existed across the border in Holland, you know. <laughs> Jews lived in Antwerp, but that was a far away, you know. Yeah. So so uh, we were brought up in a country yeah. that was totally Catholic and totally right, immersed right. in that. And and that was the family setting? Yeah. Well, the, the f my family was an ordinary sort of lower middle class, you know, m family uh. of no great uh, of no great standing, of then certainly not different from anybody else. But you, you know? certainly stood out uh, academically and so forth. You've done very well for yourself, well, young man. I was a good little student when yeah, I was good. a kid. Well, I'll tell you how good tell me, tell me how good I was. Tell me. I was so good mm. that they thought they had become I'm a priest. No, oh, oh wow, that yes. good. Yes, yeah. and that's uh -huh. when uh -huh. that's when I myself became a little sort of little different. Yeah, uh -huh. because I said I don't think so. Uh -huh. Because you know when I was old enough, I discovered there was pretty girls in the town, you know, uh -huh. and I priesthood celibacy I didn't think you I was going to be something girls, for me. You discovered girls, huh? I did. I Interesting. Did, I did, I started yeah, you're probably the first eyes, person you know, in the history of mankind <laughs> yeah, to go through it that. Yeah. It was a revolutionary <laughs> event. <laughs> Very revolutionary. It is funny, isn't it? Yes. Isn't it the human condition? It is. Really, it's almost a comedy thing. It is. Funny yeah. in our family, yeah. how my, my, I have two sisters who both became nuns. Yes. Oh, and wow. I have three brothers, and, we, and yeah. we're not, not all that religious. Yeah. Yeah. So we're in our family, there was a bit of a break. Mm -hmm. My mother was very religious, my father less so. Uh -huh. So the sons took after the father, yeah. and the, my, the daughters took and after the mother. And how did you come to get you? took a degree there and so forth, and then we got to get you because you've been in Canada. You're, from, yes, you're here yes, visiting yes. us from Canada. Well, I, I studied in the 60s. Yeah. You know what to say about the 60s. If you can yeah. remember the 60s, you just weren't oh, there. Oh, I love the 60s. Yeah. I went to University in the 60s. Oh, my could, wait a minute, did you say if you can remember the 60s, you weren't there? Yeah, exactly. That's clever. That's yeah, yeah, clever. Yeah. I just caught that. Yeah. Yeah, they no, say no. if you can remember the 60s, you, you just weren't there. You could do what they call shtick if you want, <laughs> yeah, you know, like with Mel Brooks. Yeah, you know, I could. Could, yeah. So mm. I went to university, got my degree in the, at the University of Ghent, uh -huh. studied under a, a professor, Dant, who was very good in contemporary social history. Okay. And that's where I discovered social economic history. Uh, social economics. Yes. Okay. What you could also call political economy. Okay, right. And okay. my book on the Second yeah. World War is yeah. not military history. Uh -huh. It's social economic history. Okay, yes, indeed. I caught that. And that's yeah. a very different approach. So yes, people, people who want to hear about, for example, the Battle of the Belge, I mention it, but I don't get it. No, I understand. You, I understand. you can find that somewhere else. I think you that's know? a good thing to tie history to, don't you? Because well, so much of the human condition has been shaped by economic Exactly. Things. And economic I, find, I find, unfortunately, wars are wars are a very complex historical phenomenon. Yes, absolutely. And uh, to only look at the military dimension, 
important as it is yeah. and interesting as it is. And yeah. as I myself, as a young kid, I was fascinated by that because in our family, yeah. they were talked about the First World War. They yeah. talked about the Second World War. I wasn't there, but I, I listened and yeah. I found it fascinating. Yeah. And then, for example, our village was the Germans came in in 1940 and fought their way in. And then the Canadian Army liberated our village in, uh, in 1944. And mm. there was a war cemetery there, you know. And I heard all the stories and about the fighting and uh, all the nasty things that happened. Yeah. And as a kid, you cannot help being fascinated by men in uniforms oh, and helmets sure, and machine sure, guns sure. and tanks and yeah, airplanes. Oh, oh, we oh, thought it was wonderful. Right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. For a while, I, like everybody, every other young kid, I dreamed of becoming a pilot, you know, and uh, things like that. But I mean, obviously, eventually yeah. that cooled down, that enthusiasm. Yeah. And like I say, when I discovered, when with the hi social economic history, yes. I discovered the social economic history of, of wars. Yes, that I, okay. dimension. And I've actually come to the conclusion that you cannot really understand a war unless you understand the social economic I aspect. I think so. It's usually that is what behind it all, isn't it? Exactly. Don't you think? Usually? Uh, uh, yeah. th that's very much so. Is very that much so. Does that hold almost all of history, more or less? Or uh, most, of some it, most of it. One should never generalize too there much. There was Generally speaking, Troy. one should not generalize too but much. But usually there's some economic power or interest. That's right. It's That's called right. interest. That's right. right. There's usually mm -hmm. an economic. Well, for example, if mm -hmm. you think of recent wars, yeah. the Iraq war, for example, I mean, there's a the smell of oil, right? And uh, we know that that uh, that, that there was, this war was not just about bringing democracy to the Middle East. It was about control of oil. And the control of oil, for example, is something that already played a very important role in the First World War. I think the invasion of Iraq was one of the great mistakes of history. Well, myself, that's my own feeling well, for whatever it's worth. Well, I, mean I think it was a big blunder. Well, sometimes you can ask I yourself, was it a blunder or was it uh, done deliberately? Well, done deliberately, yes, blundered yeah, into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but this is based it, you know. upon, I can remember going to Washington back when I was young and everything. They had uh, Paul Wolfowitz. Is that a Wolf? Yes, Wolfowitz. Yeah. Yeah. He was there then, and they were part of a, uh, the. The, the, what they call neocons, yes, and they were thought of as just like a lunatic fringe. And he was saying then, in the 70s, yeah. we've got to evade Iraq, yeah, we've, yeah. Got yeah. we've got to invade Iraq, we've got to invade Iraq. It was just part of a yeah. mantra that they yeah. had, yeah, exactly. and they, they pulled it off. Yeah. But let me tell you, for uh, example... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get off on yeah, another no. thing. But, but the First World War, for example. Most oh. people think that Great Britain entered the First World War because of Little Belgium. You know, most people that do know about the First World War and ask themselves, why did Great Britain get involved? We'll find out, even if they don't know, that the reason why... Britain declared war in Germany was that Germany in moved its army through neutral Belgium to attack the French. Uh -huh. And that violation of the neutrality of poor little Belgium presumably told or caused Britain to declare war in Germany. That's well, not the case. It's not true. It's, it's not true. It's true that that's the, uh, that was the excuse yeah. they needed. Okay. But the real reason was the petroleum of Mesopotamia. Oh, the petroleum really? of Iraq. Really? Absolutely. Spell it out yeah. as you can. Please. Well, what happened yeah. is this that in, until about 1900, well, the, the power and the might. And the glory of Britain was based on its on, on its the sea on power, its, on its sea power, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And it had the biggest navy in the world, you know, yeah, a bit yeah. like the United States today. Ruled the waves, bigger than any yeah. than all other navies combined. Yeah, right. Mm. And from about 1900 on, there was a problem because Germany was building a big navy. Also, that was one problem. Uh -huh. But the problem was also that they were switching from fueling their ships by coal mm -hmm. to fueling with oil, right. which was much more you know, much more eff effective, yeah, efficient. Sure, sure, right? absolutely. Yeah. Because in the past, you needed coaling stations, yes. you know, like the Falkland Islands. Right, for example, right, you know, right, which has right. another reason for fighting right. a war, right? Uh -huh. And now, with one full tank of oil, you could sail around the world. Right. And the Brits decided that we got to have oil. Now, where does yeah. the oil in Britain? For coal, coal, Britain had a lot of coal. So previously, there was no problem to power your ships because you had your own coal. But from 1900 on, the Brits are ref refurbishing their fleet. Uh -huh. They now need oil, and where do they get their oil? Does anybody know when, where people bought oil until 19, until that time, where oil was to be had? The answer is in the United States. In the United, United States? States. The United okay. States was the main supplier of oil at the time. Really? Now, okay. so that means that the, the British Navy was dependent on American oil for its power. Uh -huh. Which was not a good thing because Britain and the United States were not great friends before the First World War. There was often conflict over the border with Canada. There was a conflict over Venezuela and interests in Latin America. There were some major issues. And for a great power, to dependent on another up-and-coming great power for your oil is mm -hmm. not a good thing. Yeah. So they looked for other sources. So, the, so where are the other sources? One was Mesopotamia. They found out that there was huge deposits of oil in what is now Iraq. How long, known as how long have we known that in the modern, in more or less modern experience, that there was this source of power, uh, petroleum? Well, that's usually not I mentioned. mean, it would be not 
all the time. I mean, it, it no. was relatively recent in terms of historical yes, terms. But these things are not usually mentioned when I mean, book when Roosevelt made a deal for Saudi Arabia, they were hardly aware of any uh, yes. how important it was, if I but remember right. Yes, I, I know, but I here, here I am telling you, 1914. Yeah, that so but way back then. Yeah, way back that then. That seems way back And yeah. let me tell you, uh, without yeah. going into too much detail, yeah, I, right. I have a book, I've just finished with writing a book on the First World War, and so it's all in there. Maybe right. next year you can invite me again and we'll yeah. talk about that book. Oh, yeah. But That's the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Well, I hope so. Thank yes. you very much, mm -hmm. Harold. Now, the thing is, the reality is that the British, while they were, did have troops in France in much of the First World War, most of you know the Lawrence of Arabia, yeah. and the British troops invading what, is, what was then Palestine, yeah. the tr province of the Ottoman Empire, mm. and marching all the way to Damascus and mm. back, and then right. taking back, then holding on to it afterwards. Uh. Why? Because of the oil. Yeah. And that's what happened. So Britain actually, Britain actually was determined to lay its hands on the oil of Mesopotamia. But that was the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire was an ally of Germany. Mm -hmm. And that meant war against the Ottoman Empire, meant war against Germany. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But you couldn't say that to the public, could you? You're talking First World War. Yes, I'm talking about 1914, when Great yeah. Britain had to enter the war, was, was entered the war. So actually, were, they were happy. 14. 1914. Yeah. That when was Sarajevo? Seven years was in June, June 28, June 2014. Yeah. Yes, and I'm talking now about the the, the month after when the, the war yeah. will start. Yeah. You know, it starts virtually yeah. on July 31st, yeah. August 1st, right? Uh -huh. And at first, horrible. Britain is not really involved. Horrible. But they war. become involved. Yes, yeah. they became involved because of the oil. It was a horrible war. It was a terrible war. Awful. It was actually in, war, yeah. in terms of yeah. in terms of mortality of soldiers, it was much worse than the Second World War. Yeah. But the Second World War, many more civilians were killed yeah. because of the bombings, because of the Holocaust, and all that. Who yeah. took the brunt of the loss? Was it the Soviets in, in the, the Second World War? In the Second World War, well, the Soviets by far. They did with thirty they lost million, almost thirty million. Yes, thirty million 30 in million. the war. Yeah, yes, and you know how many people? Were, for example, most people don't know that, but. How many, what was the number of Americans killed in the Second World War, for example? I don't know. Is it 50? No. I, I'm sorry, I read no, all the an The answer is about 300 to 400,000. Is it really? Yeah. In the and Second the, War? The same as Great Of Britain. the Americans? Yes. And that actually, the, the, the British, the American losses in the f Second That's World War. That's a lot, but. Yeah. On both fronts, okay, mm -hmm. on both fronts. Combined with the British loss in the First World War, mm -hmm. were less than the losses of the city of Leningrad. The uh. city of Leningrad lost a million people. And that's more than did the total losses they, lo they, they lost that in the siege. The siege the of Leningrad was such a horror. 600,000, yes. I think, yes. well, starved to death. Well, exactly, yes. Yeah. So there was a, yeah. So there was a, there was War nasty business. sucks. <laughs> it is bad news, it yes. really That's does. why I told yeah. my parents to hold off. Yeah. You know, and I didn't want to be born during the war. My brothers didn't make the mistake. They were born during the war. That was very clever. Oh, yeah, you that worked was that out, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's that thinking I had, young man. That's right. <laughs> planning. <laughs> planning. That's right. <laughs> planning. Yeah, 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 yeah. But wait, in fact, you did your education. You did a degree there at Gantt, yes, right? And then, and then I had a brother who, had, who was older than me, but, yeah. but born in the 30s. And he had, he was a bit of an adventurer. And in 1957 already, he was 10 years older, and he had gone to Canada. He's the one who does the tourism. Yes, now. he was in tourism. Okay. And, um, and I love travel already, because history and geography were my... Were, I was that's my two, uh, that's the yeah. two things I've studied time my Time and whole space. Life. Yeah. Time and space is an right. Einsteinian thing, right? Yeah. And I love to learn the history of a country, and then, of course, when you learn the history, you want to go to that country. Yeah. And conversely, you go to a country, and if you don't know the history, you travel blind. You, that's so, true. So it's, it's you know... Once that you get going true. on it, you, you, the more you travel, the more you want to study A lot the of tourists are in that state of mind. Exactly. Don't you think that exactly, they yes. don't know what they're doing, really. And exactly. they just say, isn't that pretty? Exactly. So I, we, I'm, being done the, I'm being crude. But yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no, it's true. Yeah. And uh, so I love the combination of traveling and history. And I, when I travel, I always make, uh, make sure to read a book on the history of that country. And then you can see the connections with history elsewhere, you know, and, t and eventually things come together and lights start flashing and bells yeah, start ringing. One of the yeah. tyrannies of time in this thing is the, the time itself, because there's only so much time. I could talk to you for 40 hours <laughs> with no problem at all. We'll have to do it over AO. Right, exactly, yes. Yeah. But, I mean, you got other degrees. You got a number, yes. you got a couple PhDs well, yes. or something. Well, what happened was and that... the trouble is you're too damned interesting. Exactly, Could Thank you get you. a little dull? <laughs> oh, sometimes. Uh, Ask uh, my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I came to Canada. My brother said, why don't you, when you've done your studies in Belgium, you yeah. know, I always want to go abro live abroad for a while. Because yeah. Belgium is a wonderful little country, you know, yeah. but yeah. small. Yeah, and I, I thought you know, the same. When you were yeah. young, you wanted to you you want to see the world. Right. You know, yeah, I want to see right. the world. Yeah. So my brother said, why don't you come to Canada for a year? Mm. You can work with me a bit, you know, whatever. That's from Belgium? Yeah, he, he was in Canada already. He right? was in Canada. Oh, yeah, How did he, he was come to get to Canada? Oh, he came to Canada already when he was a young man. When doing he was the business? Years old. Doing the business? No, he came over and started a business. And no, the, he the was tourism? Yeah, right from the get go. So he told me by the time I graduated from university in Belgium, he had already been to Canada for 15 years or so, and he had an agency. 
And yeah. he said, why don't you come over and do some work? He was in Ontario then? Were in you Ontario, in yes. Near, in Ontario, that's near, a nice near part Toronto, of the world. Near Toronto, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, to make a long story short, I came over, I figured I'd stay for a year. Mm -hmm. But 40 years later, I'm still there. Yeah, yeah, and you went to school. Exactly, because once York, I was there, York I missed university. university I went to York University. Oh, studying geography, yeah, history? PhD, no, PhD in history. In history. In German okay. history. In German history. Nazi okay. Germany. Uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. And that's how I learned about Hitler. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And about the wars, more about the wars. Uh -huh. you know? And uh, so I got my, my PhD in German history. Uh -huh. And uh, then Did later on. Did you get on, another PhD? Yes. I, liked it, I, liked it, I was a keen student. Yeah. And I liked studying a lot. And uh, I won't tell you exactly how, it, how I got to do a second PhD, but mm. I did a second PhD at the University of Toronto uh -huh. in political science. Oh, pol that's where uh, Mr. McClellan was. He was, yes, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, but by yeah. the time I was there, he was out of the picture already. He, he was, was already, yeah, you were, he was before. Yeah, I was there I was there in, in the 1980s, and I think he was already uh, retired. Or, I don't he was the oracle stage. of the modern age, or, or the electronic age, yeah, which is giving was to be one more and more. The, the he wise was a real man. seer and could read James yeah. Joyce and very, very philosophically. Yeah, he was one of the, yeah, terms, one of the yeah. great wise men of Canada at the time. I think so, yeah. yeah he was. And Harold Innes also. Harold Innes. And his daughter was actually a colleague of mine when I was teaching at the university. Really? Who? Harold Innes? Well, her name was uh, Ann Dag. Uh-huh. Yes. I think I know that name. I think. I'm not maybe, sure. Yeah, maybe, no, no. maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. But anyway. So, and you're also, uh, you're also, there's, there's the term autodidact. Do you know the term? It's self-taught. Self-taught. You, you, you have a, a, a curiosity that that gets you going. It isn't that yeah. there's something, some goal you want to reach in order to do it. But you're 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 in, you're you're really truly interested in what you're doing. Well, I, I, or, I, I, I or love when what I'm doing. It down, yeah. yeah, no, I like, but, but and I Isn't read. Isn't it wonderful to love what you're doing? Yes, it is. And I, think I, like I think it's yes. a great privilege to be able it's to like what yeah. you're doing. It's true. How many people in do the like. world do you think <laughs> is able to do that? Well, and how can we measure? Could we measure that as a as an indicator of human yes. uh, progress or well. something? How many people really enjoy what it is that they're well. doing? And then you get percentages or some yeah. sort of. Thing like that. that would be an important graphic, yeah. or an, an important data point oh, for tell understanding you, the human tell you, condition. I, re I just read an article a yes, few sir. days ago mm -hmm. where it said, don't believe it when they say you can be whatever you want to be, you can do whatever you want to do, which is something you hear a lot from celebrities especially, you know, and yeah. so on. We've and the person that wrote the article, I, I don't know the name of it, was said it's not true. Uh -huh. Because if you ask a young person what they want to be, they'll all come up with something like a veterinarian or something like that. And the reality is that the overwhelming majority of people end up doing something very different from what they had planned to do or hoped to do. You think so? Uh, yes, that's what... Uh, it's uh, th 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 that's demonstrable in the research. Yes, that there was there statistics cited about uh, polls where they had asked people, you know, what job do you have? Do you like your job? The rea what, what the point of the article was, yeah, without right. going into details, yeah. that a lot of the young people had huge, huge expectations, you know, basically fed by lines like you can be whatever you want to be. Right. They all want to be a super supermodel or they all want to be, you know, like work for Victoria's Secrets, I yeah. guess, if they're girls, you know, whatever. Yeah, uh -huh. And the reality is that a very tiny minority end up doing this. The majority end up with a job that they had never wanted in the first place and, you know, basically Got very happy, and, and that was the, sto the moral well, that, story. Well, that, that, there'd be a thing like a happiness. In, you said yeah. Norman Vincent Peale, so you think positive and yeah, all that kind of yes. thing and everything. Yeah. And we did have a period after the Second World War, at least in the United States, as both it was the yeah. same in Canada, there was sort of everything was yeah. going up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, coming out of that war, I yeah. mean, everybody was getting, uh, yeah. it, was, it was a magic time yeah. for about th four, three or four or five yeah. decades, up to 18, 1980 or so. Everything yeah. changed economically. It's all economically. And then that would be something we would want. Yeah. No, that would be a goal well, it would be that people would be able to do. Exactly, exactly. Is there, is there too few things to be done that there's enough to satisfy the idiosyncratic inter interest of everybody, well, which are very varied? I mean or what is it? There's 100 trillion <laughs> cells. This is a consideration. In a human organism, yeah. there's about 100 trillion cells. There's a lot in the gut. But, but yeah. you know, and, and, and each cell matters. And each cell is connected with all the whole cells, the whole the whole system. Yeah. Yeah. So. So I mean, if you have an analogy, wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody, let's say we, we got what seven billion people We're heading for ten, nine, no. nine the UN says yeah. okay by twenty twenty or something. Yeah. If everybody was doing something that they really and truly enjoyed, yeah. in some dimension or something that yeah. could be measured, that would be like a, a state of of happiness yeah, in a certain sense for human activity yeah. or yeah. consciousness or something. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm, ra I'm rambling. Yeah, I know what but you're saying. I, that's but, interesting but research. But what you're saying you're is... You're saying they, they're not able yeah, to. That's right. That's Why right. haven't they been able yeah. to do that? But or is that a dream that can't be done? Is that utopian? Well, is it's that certainly something thinking? that government should strive for. Yes, you know? or, or I mean, the society or the intellectuals, yes. including yeah. people who can yeah. influence the society toward achieving yeah. that as a goal yeah. for everybody. Yeah. That includes everybody. Yeah. And by the way, I've got to tell yeah. you, some governments yes, seem to be interested. Okay. Because I was in Bhutan two okay. years ago. Yeah. And the kingdom of Bhutan in the Himalayas is actually quite a little happy little country in some ways. Uh -huh. It's a bit like Switzerland and the Alps, you know? Really? And really? officially, the kingdom of Bhutan has what they call the equivalent of outgrows domestic product, the uh -huh. GDP, they have a, a, a happiness factor. Well, thank you. That's yeah, something yeah. that I <laughs> is think is something? really... No, yeah, is it, nice. does it have legs? Well, I, do, I don't know how exactly they work or get, calculate it. But, but it, they, they did come up with some sort of a... Some sort of way of measuring the happiness of people. Could you measure the happy... That would be something... Uh, can you yeah. get in touch? Get, do, you have any, do you have any chapter and verse on that? Well, I know, I just, I, when I was there, our guy yeah, was very no, proud yeah, to okay, talk about that. Okay, it was an that. informal thing. But what I'm <laughs> to say that would be something that would really be a lodestar for human policy it would be yeah. or for thinking more than just what what is it yeah. that motivates human society now yeah. uh, having things it is well let's say happen. institutionally yeah I, I'm just mm, rambling it, but it's mostly money well it's Doesn't mostly it seem having. to be you see I think I think one of the problems that we have in our society now yes, Harold sir. is mm. that that we all think that happiness is about having, and it should be also be a, a much more about being. You know, Thank being you. and having important are distinction. Yeah. I'm not saying that you, that there's n having is not important. Yeah. We all want to have certain things. Well, but yeah, and being also it's hard important. to not be happy. I mean, it's not hard. It's happy. Not, if you, and like poor what Tim, Tim, could I please have a little bit more yeah, gruel? Yes. Or well, they say yes. from each according to their ability to yes. each according yes. to their need. Yeah, exactly. Yes. What about, how about reasonable wants? Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, so all yeah. you need, slave, is a little. You know what I'm yeah, saying? I know, I know, I know. It's it's scarcity. Yeah, I know. There's a scarcity and of goods, for sure. And insufficiency, or sense yeah. of insufficiency. Yeah. Well, Ma at the at the material level. Yeah. Right? yeah. Mm -hmm. But obviously, mm -hmm. having is one thing, and there's nothing particularly wrong with having certain things. We all want to have certain things. Yeah. But being something is important as okay, well. And yeah. I don't know how. It Are they you connected? Should, I want. Yeah. You should invite the ambassador of Bhutan to come and talk and explain how like it works. To, yeah. Because right. maybe they must have to find a way to measure if people are happy in a certain way, having certain things or don't not having have, certain things. Don't we have uh, th that kind of thing, or or do we have even anything that measures? Yeah. And what does it mean to be a have? Yeah. <laughs> Do you think being self interdirected or a sense of individual purpose and excitement in what you're doing, like a guy playing jazz or, 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 or somebody doing, like you said something about enjoying what you're doing. That's right. That's, a, that's an important value. It is, it is. It's a wonderful thing to be able to do that. And it doesn't yeah. apply, but to what percentage of the world well. really is that way? And then it would have to be, it's not always like well. that. There would be some yeah. times when it isn't. But to get some percentages on that yeah. and then yeah. link it to the material yeah. world. Well, and is there a lack? If, if you're starving or your child's starving, it's hard to be happy. Yeah, I saw. And a material, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So if you had material capability for what is needed in a material way, yeah. would be part of an industry yeah. that could yeah. be getting at the state of human yeah. consciousness. Yeah. yeah. There's a, like I say, I'm, I am. Bhutan. Bhutan's, I, I got to look up Bhutan. Yeah. Or yeah, get you look, yeah. yeah. You got to look up Bhutan. Yeah. But, um, you know, I've been lucky that I have been able to pursue the yeah. things that I like. Yeah. Uh, I like history. Yeah. And I've been able and to write books. And I've been able to study history. And you like And geography. I like traveling. And I like geography. And yeah. I like traveling. And I've been able to spend my whole lifetime doing these things. Yeah. A lot of people tell me, you're a lucky man. Because, and, I, and I am, because in a sense, my hobby is my job, you know. So that's, in a way, what. That's, I, that's sure. getting on to some of the things. Things that yeah, I was sort of yes, getting at. If you can have yeah. your hobby be a job. Everybody should be doing their, their thing rather than what they, uh, yeah. doing what they want to do rather than what they have yeah, to yeah. do. Exactly. And it's I an, think, an, an yeah. exaggerated like example. Like yeah. slaves, you're driven to. Yeah. It, you an know? exaggerated example of it, of course, uh, is, is, a, is an international soccer star or baseball star or hockey star that actually is paid millions of dollars to play a game they love. Right? I mean, I love to play soccer as well. Oh, I would have played. I would have played. Were you athletic? Oh, yeah, Are you I was athletic? Good. Yeah. Yeah, I was not not yeah. wonderful, yeah. but I was. Mm. I kicked the ball mm. around yeah, quite yeah, nicely. Yeah. I scored a few goals. Yeah. Mm. But I mean, I loved soccer so much that I would have gladly plunked down money to pay it, mm -hmm. to, uh, to play it. Sorry, mm. and I would have paid to play. Mm -hmm. But these guys get get paid to play. To play, yeah. And, and big bucks, right? Big bucks. It's a wow. bit crazy in a way how much they get paid. These professional athletes. Yeah, right. But in a way, that's an example of mm. people should be able to do something and make a living yeah. doing things they 
like to do. Right. That's what is it the same apply to being a movie star or a great model well, like or a lady? A or certain way. They have these kind of things like that. Yeah. Anyway, we're kind of far afield, but yes, it's all Bill. interesting and everything. Yes. And the book. When the, the, this is a rewrite uh, or a, a, no, revision, a new edition. A new edition of the book came you wrote in, in what year? In 2000. 2000. And it's okay. out in, the, in six languages. Six la yes. How many languages do you speak? Only one. How many languages? Only one. Only one. At the time. No, only one at a time. Start the year thing, so. <laughs> but since I also speak out of both corners of my mouth, oh, you can cut it out. Right? You're doing and I speak with a forked tongue. Oh, God. So I can, so so I can double it again. Uh, I speak about five, six languages. Five or six, that's yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. But I, I mean, some I speak better than others, you know. I can speak I French. I through Turkey one time <coughs> when I was young, you know, just in Valdery and all that, and got a ride with a guy in a big truck going toward Ankara or out of Ankara. And he, had, he was a business type guy and everything. He was an Armenian born in Iran. Yeah. And he was speaking to me in, uh, and he was legitimate. And he, he was speaking to me in idiogrammatic English. And he told me that he could speak 24 languages. Wow. That's you would lot. think your head would get full of it. Yes. But 24 languages idiogrammatically. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I wonder what the limit is on that. There's about 7,000 <laughs> languages. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Well. I mean, in a way, I know one thing about languages, you know, it, it, people often say, well, you speak quite a few languages, it's amazing. It's not really amazing. Because if you travel a lot and you, you come from a small country where there's already two languages for starters in a very a small country the size of Delaware or something like that, and then you get Germany next door and England next door, so you have to learn Flemish and French and German and, and, and English and stuff. Just to go to the shop. Yeah, you know, today, young people in Belgium, if you don't have at least three languages, you can't get a job at all. You know, you know something you interesting about that also that I was just thinking of the other day talking it? to my dog yeah. about it, and he seemed to think it was interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, is, you know, one thing about learning to talk, yeah. you don't have to be taught. That's right. You, you don't have to be taught to talk. <laughs> no, no, you can just... Uh, you, you just you just learn. Yeah, sometimes it's a bit like swimming. You can know, you, you do that water. with other things in terms of learning or, or yeah. autodidactism or yeah. something like that? Well, or do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Except you want to make sure, you, yeah. Well, this, the analogy, I think, is more with swimming. Swimming. You, to, to yeah. you cannot read a book about swimming and then go in the water. You got to go in the water and move around, and eventually you'll swim. It's the same with a language. Some people don't are, don't dare to speak it because they don't speak it well, because they yeah, feel. Yeah, but somebody doesn't even realize you grow up with your mother's knee. You just well, speak, well and exactly. you never you did, you don't remember learning it. You just no, learn no, it. No, exactly. But I'm just it's saying. It's environmental. Learn, yeah, but learning other languages yeah, is also right. some. Yeah. I learned some languages by just going to a country, and trying to figure it out and mm. picking up words and saying a few words. And before I knew it, I realized I could actually get myself understood probably very poorly and very poor Spanish, mm. say, which I learned that way. But then people appreciate that you're trying to, and as they, as they give you feedback, you get to improve what you're saying. Mm. And before you know it, you actually end up saying words that you didn't know you knew, and you actually get better at it. And as you get better at it, you get more confidence, and you learn more, and then, you know, and you're on your way. It's like swimming. You're mm. now mm. floating. You're now m moving in the water. You're swimming. And that's how it is with languages mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. You can't just study it, study it, study it, and say, okay, I got it. I know Spanish. I'll now go to Spain or to Mexico or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. You got to go there and open your mouth and, and start. You know, one so other thing along that line. I got a friend, a young friend who's an entrepreneurial type kind of guy with these things, uh, algorithms and all that kind of stuff. He wants yeah. to use the color spectrum, uh, 10 million shades of yellow and that yes. kind of thing in order to have an algorithm where you could take the languages of the world in real time yes. to 7,000. Yeah. And, and it's going exponential. The capability is going. NSA is wasting all this time putting out, you know, dossiers on us all. Near. But you could do that where you speak in any language, and it would in real time, in real present like that, translate to the languages of the yeah. world back and forth. Well, Do you think that would be an advance in human society, or would uh, that be... We're losing a lot of languages. Yes, yeah, we are. We are losing language. That's what I understand. Anyways, yeah, yeah, culturally, it's a yes, problem. Yes, and of course. But would it be good if we could all tr get over the babble? You know. Well, you got to uh, keep we in could mind. all speak, and we could just do it. Yeah, we could yeah. uh, communicate with everybody in all the languages yeah, of the yeah, world. In an ideal world, we'd all speak, communicate. Well, is perfectly. it so right. wrong to think about an ideal world, or no. is that is that woolly gathering and so forth that ought to be discouraged, particularly among the young? to dream about or think about things in idealistic terms of how things might be? 
But I think there should be or an ideal. Or is that just no. woodly headed no, thinking should be should an be ideal, discouraged? But there should also be the realization that it cannot be achieved overnight. I mean, the idea of, of a utopia that's going to materialize tomorrow, that's, of course, that's nonsense. Day after but tomorrow. Yeah, well, maybe a little later. But, uh, I mean, uh, certainly uh, that it, there should be ideals. I think uh, the problem that we have today in our society is yeah. there's lots of idols, yeah. but there's not many ideals anymore, you know, and there should be an ideal. That's there should be an ideal to make progress, for example, to for a kind of greater happiness, yeah. whatever that is. That happens. You well, know, you got Bhutan's yes. happiness index. Yeah, well, that's exactly. the start Something the right like that. direction. There should, there yeah. should be, sure, certainly, there should be, we should aspire to a better future than what we have now. Mm -hmm. And I think we should certainly try to avoid a worse future, which is not a possibility that we're dealing because with right now. Because particularly if you draw it out to where the weapons are seized. Exactly. 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 So we now we're talking about wars We can't again. just have the old war thing no, of no. realpolitik with uh, the soldiers yeah, yeah. sending all the rules of everything through no. conquest. The right of conquest is the first law no. of inter uh, the first uh, the first rule of international law. You can conquest other people. You can, Conqu you conquer, can conquer yeah. other people. Yes, but now and I mean, that's realpolitik, and that still holds at a certain there, level yeah. in terms of the relationship yes. between the nations, doesn't okay. it? But we were just and saying doesn't it relate to your book? Yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah. So realpolitik, real that's politic. called realistic. Well, it was the term of the ninth, late 19th century coined by Bismarck, I believe. Well, yeah, I thought uh, that Karl Haushofer, too. Karl Haushofer well, in Germany, well, he had a different thing. There were the theoreticians and the practitioners of it. I'm yeah. talking about the practitioner, which yeah. was Bismarck. Yeah, yeah. And I guess Haushofer was probably the theoretician. You know, mm -hmm. There was always people who would theorize and yeah. you know, the intellectuals who then sort of float these ideas, and there's the politicians who practice it. Uh -huh. But Bismarck was certainly a, the most famous practitioner of real politics. Oh, know. really? Okay. Yes, yeah. he was. Well, I mean, if any, any story, I think, or any discussion of real politics, mm -hmm. you know, of realistic, hard-nosed politics would certainly have to mention Bismarck. Well, it'll be realistic. If you conquer somebody, it's realistic that, yeah, and at some point if you have a conflict, somebody wins. Well, but and then the other loses. And, uh, you know, the idealism that was motivating that, yeah. uh, people get conquered. Yeah, and evolution, things get conquered in things. It's but part of in you Bismarck's know. time, yeah. the progress or, or, had or, a lot or of still progress seen in Bismarck's still time. seen in terms of making a country bigger and more powerful, uh, and necessarily at the expense of others. And the real necessarily at the expense of others is that's that a, right. is that, that, that a, is that a concomitant necessity? Right. Yes, in those days, that? in those days, it was not in believed. Those days. What that it could be still hold? Does it still hold in political now? Is well, it still who's got the army rules? It's if you're going to conquer, you have, if you, for every conquest, there's those that are conquered and there are those that are being conquered. Yeah, right. So there's the the victors and there's the, the victims. There's yeah. the losers. You know, there's no th that is something that maybe today we'd like to sort of pretend is not true. We'd like to think that we, there's going to be a war and we're all going to be winners. It's a humanitarian war and all well, that. Well, that would be is is that something that we would want to discourage people from thinking that everybody can win? Well, that's absolutely. Is that easy, something? Yeah. That is yeah. it is it un yeah. it hasn't held ever yeah. in terms of all no. we got two hundred thousand no. years of human history has never held no. in terms of the social order political order yeah. is it a possibility that's before us now perhaps even no. as the weapons that we've developed as a way of undergirding no. that no. are become so terrible that they can wipe out the entire evolutionary yeah. process yeah. of humanity. Well, this is it. So that there would be a reverse side to that yeah. that would be dealing with this idealism, perhaps yeah. not as something to be dismissed as woolly right. thinking, but something that's rather to be encouraged, like the happiness yeah. index, or well index right. about how far are we along towards transcending scarcity, even. Yeah. Is well, there enough, maybe? In that respect, in mm. terms of the power of the weapons, mm. things have changed, the situation has changed dramatically since, since the times of Bismarck. Uh -huh. In the times of Bismarck, they were powerful armies already. Mm. In fact, they were probably already more powerful than people suspected, which was proven by the First World War, yeah. which was much deadlier than expected. It was, it was much more horrible, horrible war, exactly. But today, we have ma weapons of mass destruction yes, that can blow, blow up the whole planet, essentially. But in the days of Bismarck, realpolitik was something like the idea that we have a big army, mm. uh, we can conquer. If we're going to conquer, we gonna, it's going to be at the expense of a competitor yeah. or somebody else. Yeah. And that's too bad, so sad. But we have the might, therefore yeah. we have the we are right, right, and we're going to do it. it and that's hold. that's the bloody business it's of war. It's by the world and leadership, and, and does it not? Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. That's so under Bismarck, the implications were not necessarily as devastating as they can be today. That's uh. what really 
you're saying. Yeah, right. Today, a Bismarckian imperial politic mm. holds a risk which it did not hold in the days of Bismarck himself. Thank you. It should be more yeah. made more I clear. Think that's, I think that's how I took it. Yeah, point. yeah. In the days of Bismarck, the mm. biggest weapon was probably the Krupp, you know, b big gun that would fire from at one point of from 40 kilometers or 40, 40 miles even to Paris. Mm. And that was a big deal. And a big a big shell would drop in Paris Wouldn't and would destroy did. three, four houses. Yeah, and that right. was a big deal. Yeah, today, right, 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 today right. the equivalent of yeah. that is, 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 is destruction yeah. of the planet. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or the Gatling yeah. gun. Exactly, exactly. The British yeah. used the Gatling gun in India to, were, to conquer. Well, I mean, that, that's more or less. They rule yes. the waves with the military. The first thing they do is they set up a military. That's exactly. the history yes. of the world. And in those days, you had the army that was a real, realistic. and It's was still real. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, but it's re yeah. be realistic, young man. Don't be an idealist, yeah, exactly, is what yeah. they say. Or you're right? going you're, you're no, to be places. realistic. Yes, yeah. yes. And, uh, well, there was so a, there was a time was of social Darwinism where mm, there was competition was, for survival. And the winners would win, and the losers would fall by the wayside. That is that the was case the idea. of evolution, is yes, it not? Yes. The well, that was the, that was the uh, idea uh, was how it was interpreted, for sure. About 9999 percent of all species that have ever existed have gone extinct, you will notice. Yeah, oh yeah, that's true. Just, but there's there's yeah. also new species originating, isn't it? Uh, well, <laughs> yes, through a process of punctuating. Do you yeah. think we may be coming to the, we're here 200,000 years. Yeah as a species. That's 10,000 generations. Do you think there's anything to be said that this may be the defining generation? It's hard uh, to think. Maybe other people in the third se third century thought that or something, it, but that it really is, and there's uh, evidence that could be making the, this is a time of qualitative transformation, perhaps liberation, uh, the prophetic tradition to be realized that has been longed for. Of, uh, you know, uh, that's what I'm saying. A unique time, not like the French Revolution or some yeah. other period in history, but a unique moment in terms of evolutionary yeah. development. Well, the, the final or generation, not. or it could be the final generation, pretty well. If you uh, <laughs> use that play on words. Well, what would there be? There was, there was, there was, there was consciousness before there was Homo sapiens yes. up the line. Yeah, but consci consciousness. Is there is there a, a level of consciousness beyond which we have been for two hundred thousand years? Well, I'm not into this kind of philosophy, uh, Harold. But I can tell you something that I am pretty pessimistic with respect to the oh, future well of, it's our, pretty, of our species. It's pretty, if you're really pessimistic in serious terms, that's very very worrying. It is. It is yeah. worrying because I think we have lots of reasons to worry. Yeah. If you look at even what happened in Japan recently with that nuclear reactor spilling as we speak, yeah. still the radioactive mm. uh, junk into the Pacific. Yeah. And they still have no way, f no way of stopping <coughs> it. I mean, soon if this goes on, coming to yes. the floor now, if yeah. this goes on, actually, I don't see us being here 50 years from now. Uh huh. That sounds a bit pessimistic. Mm -hmm. so a bit, say, a bit, like a whole lot. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, unless things we change, uh, and there's this defining or uh, final uh, generation decides to th change things soon. So the capability for real qualitative change is coming just exponentially, as much as the weapon systems or the things on the destructive side. It is. The ability to take care of people uh, and, and to have the fulfilling of a good life and a material one is growing. We have a capability of taking care of everybody. Yes, capability. Well, we haven't had yeah. historically. Yeah. But capability is one there thing. There wasn't enough. Yeah, but capability is one thing, but the will is another thing. Well, it is, but capability yeah. you yeah. have before you get yeah. the the actuality. Yeah. If you have the, if you don't have the cap, you could have been a hundred years ago. You couldn't fly to yeah. Paris. No. You couldn't know how to get there on a bicycle with the De De Delton. Or the, you know the people, yeah. the uh, Wright brothers, were giving you the bike. Yeah. You were limited in terms yeah. of what you could do or what was able yeah. to be done. Yeah. So. But the ability to t alter the human condition right. in an improved way yeah. is growing all the time, and there, yes. there are things that are. But we're growing with that is yeah. the, the illusion, I think, that technology can solve all the problems. Well and there's a techno te fix, and that's that's a bit of a problem right there. I suppose it is. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, we, you know, one of the things is you're too damned interesting in this yeah. book. Well, the, yeah. the myth of is really a good book. I've read Thank great you. great uh, parts of it Thank and you. so forth, and it's a it's a story of the. War and also the, the 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 taking of the war as something that is a great and glorious thing and that sort of thing yeah. ought to be taken with a big grain of salt. A big grain of salt, yes. Yeah. Um, in my book, uh, th this book was inspired by what I felt perceived to be a contradiction in uh, the American history as I started to learn it after coming to Canada mainly because when we were in Europe, 
who didn't really learn much uh, North American history, uh, uh -huh. American and right. Canadian. You, you, you no, that's interesting. No, but, yeah. but I, I made it a point when I came to Canada and the New World, you know, and the other side of the Atlantic, to also study American history. Yeah. And of course, uh, I had been brought up, you know, soaking up the history of the war from family and so on, and the Americans had liberated us, and uh, no, no problem with that, and that is very true, and I acknowledge that in my book. Yeah. But my, the question that kept nagging me was, why did the United States enter the war when they did? Which actually, when I asked the question, even to uh, American friends, most of them don't seem to know that. Mm -hmm. When the United States, I asked the question, when the United States declare war on Germany? Maybe we can ask uh, the, the, the spectators here, does anybody yeah. know when exactly the United States declared war on Germany? Wow. And then most people say, well, mm -hmm. well informed, say, well, Pearl Harbor. Okay, at the time no, of Pearl no, Harbor. So, well, not quite, Japan. because Pearl Harbor, that was the Japanese attacking the United States, right. and the Germans had nothing to do with it. Hitler didn't even know about it. Mm -hmm. And the day after Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt asked Congress to declare war on Japan. Uh -huh. Did he say, by the way, boys, while yeah. we're at it, let's mm. also declare war on those nasty Germans? No, he didn't. Uh, right. Why didn't he? Because yeah. the Germans had nothing to do with yeah, it. Yeah, right, right, right. So, the actual fact is that the United States never declared war on Nazi Germany. Uh -huh. Is that Nazi right? Germany declared war on the United States. Uh huh. Yeah, Four. that's true. That is true, yeah. yeah. Which raises the yeah. question. Yes, sir. When would the United States had declared war on Nazi Germany. Yeah. If Nazi Germany hadn't declared war on the United States. What do you come up with? Well, that, that's speculation now. But I yeah, can tell I you one thing. Yeah. It, it, it raises the question, mm -hmm. why did Germany declare war on the United States? Mm -hmm. Four days after Pearl Harbor, on the 11th of December, 1941, that's when there was a message arriving that German ambassador delivered to the White House the message we're declaring war on you. And actually, they were shocked. Roosevelt and the boys were shocked that Germany declared war, because in a sense, they weren't seeking war with Germany. And mm -hmm. what happened at Pearl Harbor had nothing to do with Germany, uh -huh. but Hitler declared war on them. And the reason why he did it uh -huh. was out of, out of desperation. Because a few days before Pearl Harbor, uh -huh. right, a few days only, uh -huh. on the 5th of December 1941, Hitler was told by his own generals that he'd lose the war. The turning point of the war was the 5th of December 1941. That's when, before Moscow, mm -hmm. when the Germans had been advancing into Russia for since June 1941, yeah. thinking it'd be over in six to eight weeks, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's now December, yeah. and they're still not over, yeah. and they're getting desperate because they're out of oil, uh -huh. oil, oil, yeah. right? And on the 5th of December, there's a Russian counterattack, and the Germans have driven back. And that day, the generals report to Hitler, we're going to lose the war. Because mm -hmm. to win the war, we had to win it fast. Mm -hmm. And we didn't win it fast, and we cannot win anymore. You're going to lose it. Hey. And Hitler was still chewing, basically, the carpet, as he liked to do, thinking about that, when he found out, basically reading in the paper a few days later, that the United States had been attacked by Japan at Pearl Harbor. Uh -huh. And he said, my God, what's going on in the world? Mm -hmm. And uh, he called his generals together and said, I've got a brilliant idea. Uh -huh. And they said, what, Mr. Adolf? Mm -hmm. He said, well, we're going to declare war in the United States. And they say. You must be crazy. Uh -huh. We're already in deep trouble in Russia. Why mm -hmm. would you do a thing like that? And Hitler's idea was that if he declared war on the American enemy of his Japanese friends, uh -huh. his Japanese friends being the gentlemen which he supposed they were, would turn around and declare war on his enemy, you know, on, on the Russians. And that then would have forced the Soviets to fight a two-front war against the Germans in, in uh, Europe. Who's thinking a that two front war. Who's That's what Hitler's thinking was. Yeah, Hitler. Hitler's yeah, thought yeah, that, yeah. that if he, by declaring war in the United States, uh -huh. that his Japanese buddies would be so impressed uh -huh. that they would reciprocate uh -huh. by declaring war on Russia uh -huh. in, in Siberia. And that's the what they were after. And that's what he was after. Now they, that's they, 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 they were against the Bolsheviks. They were, of course. Yeah. But Hitler, and Hitler felt it that way, then the Russians have to fight a two-front war, and then maybe, maybe, maybe we'll still have a chance to win the war, right? But what happened is that when he declared war on the 11th of December on the United States, mm -hmm. you know, the Japanese said, thank you very much, and did nothing, and did not declare war on the Soviets. And that meant that Hitler was even in deeper trouble, because now he had to not only still face the Russians, but he knew that sooner or later the Americans would be coming as well. And that made the situation even worse. Wow. Yeah. So that's the main reason why. Yeah. But essentially, you can ask, the qu it raises the question mm -hmm. also, yeah. when would the United States have declared war on, on Germany if Germany had not declared war on the United mm. States? Mm -hmm. And it's a painful question in a way, because the answer may well be never. Yeah. Because never, in a never. In a, never. In a way, why, why, why do I say a thing like that? Yeah. I say a thing like that, because looking back now, we have the impression that most Americans at the time were against Hitler, hated Hitler, despised Hitler, you know, and so on. And while that's true for the majority of Americans, yeah. it's not true, true for, for a small the oligarchs. Minority. 
And there was a small number of oligarchs, right. as you call them, as you know, always corporate there have and banking oligarchs, yeah. Yeah. who were very happy with Hitler and very happy with Hitler. Yeah, yeah, right. Because the saying Ford was, had a big factory you can there, do yeah. business with Hitler. Yeah, right, right. And indeed, most big American corporations had branch plants in Germany, yeah. producing weapons for the Nazis and making big bucks. And you notice at well. the end, when it was all coming, Dresden firebombing and that, but they saved the Ford factory and other kinds of things. And, and, and that was and in Cologne. Farber and all those kinds That's of things correct. they did. They so they And what their eye was on about was attacking somehow, or getting the attack on the Bolsheviks, that they were, Eventually. the oligarchs of the West were worried e about Bolshevism and uh, the Soviet That's Union, correct. I believe. Do you? Yes, correct. Is I that, actually, is that I correct? explained that. I explained yeah. that. I explained the prehistory of the war by looking at the 1920s and mm -hmm. even the end of the First World War in the 1930s, when what you call the oligarchs, and that's as good a term as any, yeah. meaning the, the captains of industry, Henry yeah. Ford was an example, yeah. had much more sympathy for the fascists and for Nazis yeah. who yeah. Could, could do business yeah. with them. Big and they hated, the, there, they hated the Bolsheviks in Russia because yeah. they were the antithesis of the capitalist system. Yeah. They saw them as the counter system to capitalism. Uh -huh. And actually, they, we saw who the uh, counter system you know, to this capitalist system, uh, you know, a yeah. counter system. So, and I'll so what is the counterfeit? Well, it means the opposite. No, I know, I know, yeah, but yeah. what was the opposite? Well, the, the, the Russian system we the, built. The, the the Bolshevism. Bolshevism. Well, that's Marx and co communism. Yes, Mar yeah, communism. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they, they hated they hated the commies. So the they were Reds. really worried about the the pronouncement of uh, you know the the the, uh, the the importance of the Soviet Union as a a bastion of uh, communism in opposition to uh, exactly. capitalism. But then there was two. There was two reasons. Way. Yes, and then there was two reasons for liking na Nazism. Hitler, first of all, you could do business with Hitler. Because yeah. Hitler, it, the brand, American branch plants in Germany, which was set up already before Hitler, did very well under Hitler because they could produce weapons and trucks and tanks and everything else right. and made a lot of money. Hitler paid the bills. Yeah. And secondly, when the, in the 30s, Hitler was rearming uh -huh. Germany to the T. Mm -hmm. And the question would have come up, what is this going to be used for? Mm -hmm. There's going to be a war, isn't it, Mr. Adolf Hitler? Yeah. The answer would have been, of course, there's going to be a war. Mm -hmm. Against whom? Against the Soviet Union. Yeah. Well, that's what they wanted to that get. That was another reason that for like fine with them. Exactly. Yeah. So here we make mm. money mm. You know, from a guy who's mm. actually going to do the dirty work for us by wiping out the Soviets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was a wonderful thing, wasn't it? Mm. So let's we like this guy. Mm. And Henry Ford was liked Hitler a lot, and there was a lot of other m great managers and owners of uh, big American corporations like General Motors, uh, IBM, ITT. You know, Singer, Singer, for example. You know, made machine guns for for Nazi Germany. You know, hardly imagine that, but they yeah. did. And yeah. they made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And they kept on making money even during the war. And, and always at that level, the, th the, the thing at that time uh, was the, the target of, uh, uh, of their concern was the communist menace. It was, but it was also making money. Uh, so yeah, well, so yeah, you could but have it both ways. But, you but could make they, money and, they thought and that the dicta or the thought that the proletariat could rise or the yes. masses could rise against uh, the right. system Yes. was valid in uh, Marxian terms. Exactly. Well, or in communism terms. The Soviet in, Union uh, was a bad uh, example. It was a bad example for, you know, for as your it own happened, because they, Yeah, because there in the 30s, there were still lots of communi communists yeah, in, in, right. in the States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was, uh, there was the, the, there was still the, the red 30s. Yeah, the 30s yeah. were the dirty 30s. Mm -hmm. It was bad, bad, bad business mm -hmm. with the, the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. Those were the red 30s, mm -hmm. you know, because there were lots, lots of commies and, and socialists and anarchists and you name it. Mm -hmm. and, and for many of those, the Soviet Union was the inspiration uh -huh. and the guiding yeah. light. Right. And therefore, you wanted to wipe them out. Yeah. And since you couldn't do it, you mm -hmm. know, Hitler would do it. Yeah, and Hitler's yeah. in Mein Kampf. It's written very clearly. Mm -hmm. He's going to wipe out. He's going to wipe I out. I read the in your Union. book somewhere that in the end, when the British were with the Americans and it was all coming after Dresden and yeah. firebombing and all that, a lot of the uh, Germans just acquiesced and everything in that. In the thought, there was the thought that there would be a joining against the Soviet Union. Well, there was that hope in the there German was that hope side, among yes. our, our, our yeah. Yeah. circles that they That's wanted cool. to attack. Yeah. Collectively, yes. the Soviet Union. The enemy was that the was, Soviet that was the Union. That was a great hope. And but and it was what Kennan, Kennan, George Kennan, and that and the containment. Yes, yes. They had containment came up afterward right. until yeah. we get yeah. to 1989, yeah. and then that that thing uh, was seen not to be viable. But they were really worried about the uprising of the mass of the people of they the were, they were world against yeah. their owner, yes. their their leadership. That's correct, yeah. Are they still the owner, well, the uh, oligarchs of the world, still worried <laughs> about there being a massive yeah. uprising yeah. in the name of Karl Marx in 
48 the danger is not uh, not it is the same the same way there mm. is no communism that no longer have the force it that it was uh, the, 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 it's the a inspiration spent force. it's the spent it's force well the, the, the proletariat challenge I in marxian uh, terms in recent years marx mm. has been rediscovered there's been a lot of re 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 books by marx have been published and been selling quite well recently mm. because of the crisis of the, the capitalist there world is a, there is a crisis right yeah, yeah. so people are discover rediscovering marx but of course i don't think communism will ever be again what it was at one point, and the Soviet Union but will never that time, be born again. But at that time, in the Second again. World War, it was it really was thought that way in serious terms. And, yeah, to come and, back and guided policies. Yeah. And yeah. to come back to your question, yes, the not only was the Soviet Union seen to be a source of inspiration for your own Reds, therefore, you know, there they was you yeah. by wiping them out, you'd wipe out the hope of your own Reds. But the, the Soviet Union was also the great guiding light and source of inspiration for freedom fighters in the colonies. Okay. You see, and in right. semi-colonies. Yeah. So essentially, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Soviet Union Union supported uh, yeah. independence movements. Yeah. That's the reason why, for example, why were the independent movements in Vietnam? Why were they communists? Yeah. Because the communists, the communists well, supported uh, the, and the and the, the Western world did not. Well, yeah, well, that was all. And then, re and then, forty-eight, the red. The, the, it was like an amoeba coming out of the heartland. Yes, you know, it was coming out of the uh, Eurasian landmass, and so where there's Soviet Union, and then all of a sudden there comes China, there comes China and that was no. like a big amoeba coming yeah. out. We and lost China. Yeah, we lost China yeah. and all that. That was George Kennan. Yeah. That's they that's did, right. and that's yeah. more or less the yeah. history of the world after the yeah. war. But I want to go back here to one more point. Okay, we only got a couple minutes yes, left. Okay, so well, just a few minutes. Haiku. Up. Okay, very good. <laughs> uh, the, um, the, 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 the big captains of industry, the oligarchs in the United States, mm -hmm. in the 30s, liked Hitler a lot mm -hmm. for because he would make money with him, mm -hmm. and they could, he was going to do the dirty job of wiping out the Soviets. Mm -hmm. And uh, unlike what a lot of people think now, the fact that Hitler was a racist and yeah. an anti-Semite didn't bother them at all, uh -huh. because most of them were racist and anti-Semites themselves. Well, I'll be damned. Well, okay. Henry Ford wrote the book, The International Jew, which has actually provided Hitler with yeah, inspiration. Yeah, 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 said it's yeah, yeah, in the yeah, book yeah. as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's in the book. Yes, it is. It's in the book. There's a picture there of Henry Ford, actually, his yeah. book, I believe. Yeah. I hate to tell you, I'm from Detroit, and my grandmother, oh, yeah. Henry Ford used to tinker in my grandmother's garage when he was about eight years yeah, old yeah, yeah, before yeah. I went to the factory. Yeah. Okay, your pleasure. To have the uh, uh, yeah your your uh, masterful work is Thank really you very much. much. It couldn't be re more recommended more highly. Uh, American Second World War: The Myth of the Good War, Revised Edition, and Jacques Pauls is the author. Uh, uh, and you can see a major contributor to the intellectual improvement of the human condition. I thank you for the work and for all the all the good work and a lot of the, all of these stories and so forth lend into a tapestry that is relevant to these other broader questions we were talking to and the consequences of it is that the world is very uh, one last little thing we had a couple minutes left are you optimistic pessimistic for the human prospect well right now i'm pessimistic you are truly i am truly pessimistic i'm truly pessimistic i quite honestly fear that we may not be there a hundred and even fifty years from now and i'm sad to say that but i wish i could be optimistic but i'm not uh, okay. I think, uh, uh, I think we have a major problem on our hands. Uh, we have to change things drastically, radically, uh, soon. What is the what are uh, there? There used to be gambling in Casablanca, and there were odds and so forth. Do you play the horses? No. You don't play no, the horse. Don't you don't gamble. read the racing form. Don't you don't gamble. gamble. No, I drink so, but they have what they call <laughs> they have what they call odds, right? Yeah. yeah the what odds. are the odds that we might be able to uh, pull it off in a, well. another kind of way, or what are the sources of pulling it off to avoid? Uh, the outcome, because as you and I shared before we started well, the program, the weapons now in yeah. the hands of the oligarchs well, are species lethal. Well, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think there's a danger. The, the biggest risk is of a war again. Yeah. It could be a war over over a stupid uh, issue. It could be anywhere in the Middle East. Of course, is a power keg. We can know that. There could be a war, and the war indeed, if 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 the, if the ones who fight the war use the weapons they have, yeah. could be the end of the planet. I think it would have to be the weapons of the United States well, of America to get at the species. Yes, or but the Soviet. Well, I, I don't think the uh, the lesser ones would do it. No, but, but I mean it would be it's the tried and But I mean, India, and Pakistan, that's no. potential for a nuclear I know. war. Is huge one there I too, know. you know. And to, uh, to, to, well, exactly. remember, Sarajevo started, you know, yeah. Guns of August. Barbara exactly. Tuckman, nobody yeah. thought it was going to happen. It was all.